And welcome everyone as you're coming into the room. We're going to give folks a, a couple more minutes uh, to join. And so if you all wouldn't mind just adding, uh, you know, your name and your affiliation and maybe how you're feeling today in the chat, uh, just so folks can see who's tuning in and from what parts of the world, that would be wonderful. Up, up, up. We got to enable the chat, uh, Nilanka. Okay. Well, you all can prepare mentally for what you will put in the chat momentarily. Okay, I think I fixed the chat, so everybody should be able to talk to everybody else. Wonderful. Welcome, everyone, again. Um, we're going to start momentarily, but uh, please, if you don't mind, greeting the group uh, in the chat by uh, putting in your name, whatever affiliation you'd like to list, and um, maybe a, an adjective about how you're feeling today. Marvelous. We're seeing some good feelings, notwithstanding. All right. Well, uh, Nilanka, I think we're gonna we're gonna kick things off. So great. Well, um, welcome everyone, and um, greetings from wherever you are in the US and around the world. And welcome to today's, dis today's discussion on facilitating and training in cross-sector movements, turbocharging efforts for coordination and collaboration, uh, which is a wonderful Tabitha Thompson title actually uh, for this event. And just to, to say that uh, Tabitha played a seminal uh, role in organizing today's gathering. She's actually on maternity leave um, but joining us, but many thanks to Tabitha and to uh, Nilanka, Senevaratna, and Gabe Lerner for all their efforts um, in organizing today's events. Um, so my name is Maria Stefan, and I co-lead together with Julia Roy the Horizons Project, uh, which is an organizing platform focused on strengthening relationships, sense making, and collaboration between the social justice democracy and bridge building communities in the US, while also facilitating domestic international learning and solidarity. And today we'll be speaking with a distinguished group of panelists about the current state of movement building support in the US and how training and convening spaces can be envisaged more creatively to support a broad based front or movement to counter the rising authoritarian threats and to build a democracy that works for all Americans. While our conversation today will be focused on the US, we think there is also a great deal of significance um, for uh, cross-border um, cross relevance and significance. So why are we having this conversation now? Like perhaps everyone in this room, Horizons is deeply concerned about the state of US democracy which as many of you know, was formally classified as backsliding last year by a European-based uh, democracy watchdog organization. We're concerned about the alarming rise of political violence and extreme us versus them politics that are characteristic of authoritarian systems. This is not our first experience with authoritarianism in the US, however. The system of Jim Crow following the end of the reconstruction period was one of the most virulent and violent forms of authoritarian single party rule in our history. While the January 6th, 2021 
attempted insurrection was a dramatic reminder that it can happen here to cite Sinclair Lewis, who was writing about fascism in the US in the 1930s. The rise in political violence, mostly but not exclusively from far right groups and state and local efforts to undermine free and fair elections are worrisome no matter which issues we care the most about, whether that be climate, healthcare, immigrant rights, workers' rights, or many others. At the same time, we know that the only way that we have ever gotten closer to freedom and justice for all in the United States, and what plenty of research has shown to be the strongest bulwark against authoritarianism globally, has been powerful, broad-based coalitions and movements capable of mobilizing people across difference. The history of the US is in many ways the history of movements to achieve an independence from colonial rule, to abolish slavery, to make suffrage truly universal, to expand civil and political rights for all, the list goes on. These movements have relied on a combination of dialogue and nonviolent action to build bridges, build power, and build belonging. Training and facilitation are essential to building movement strength and sustainability. They have played a critical role in pro-democracy movements in the US, including in our civil rights movement, in the Philippines, Serbia, South Africa, and countless other places. And members of our panel today have written extensively on this topic. At Horizons, we believe that both dialogue and direct action, organization and mobilization, blocking harm and building democratic abundance are necessary to overcome the divide and rule tactics that are endemic to the authoritarian playbook. So now to help shed light on the roles played by movement training and facilitation in both upholding and reimagining US democracy, we will now turn to a very talented and accomplished group of speakers. You will find links to their full bios in the chat. So I invite my colleagues to put those in the chat now. Um, but let me introduce them briefly. Yvonne Marvik is the Director of Field Education and Applied Research at the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict. Since playing a leading role in OTPOR, a youth movement which helped bring down the dictator Slobodan Milosevic in Serbia, Yvonne has become one of the leading educators in the field of strategic nonviolent action. Nadine Block is the training director at Beautiful Trouble, a global network of organizers, artists, trainers, and writers, where Nadine's work explores the potent intersection of art, movements, and politics. Jake Waxman is an advisory board member and a senior trainer with the Leading Change Network. He's led over 200 workshops and trained over 1,500 coaches and 15,000 participants in the craft of public narrative and leadership, organizing and action. Carlos Saavedra has been active in the immigrant rights movement for the last 20 years, building and co-founding organizations for immigrant right for immigrant students and workers. Since founding the Amy Institute in 2013 and earlier the Momentum uh, organization, he has been coaching and training organizers and leaders in movement building. And finally, Reverend Stephen Green is an activist and pastor who leads with radical love in action through his ministry at the St. Luke AME Church in Harlem, and as chair of Faith for Black Lives, a faith-based social justice organization. He is also the creator and host of the podcast, Sacred Desk with Reverend Stephen Green, which features conversations with thought leaders and change agents focused on the latest headlines. So without further ado, we're going to start the discussion uh, with our panelists, and then uh, following that, we will invite uh, an active discussion with you all um, from around the world. So I'm going to start uh, the first kind of question uh, with you, Yvonne, and you, Nadine. So in your experience uh, working with movement leaders and organizations around the world, what are the most effective ways that you've seen training, facilitation, coaching, used to support movements that are trying to counter authoritarianism and strengthen democracy. Uh, Yvonne, maybe I'll start with you. Uh, 
to unmute myself. Thank you very much, Marianne. So I'm so happy to be here today and uh, take part in this panel. It's really exciting. And you know, as you know, as you uh, said, like I was a, a part of the Otpor movement uh, fighting against Milosevic. So we're talking like 20th century. Uh, like it's good to have like us old folks talking about stuff that happened a long time ago. And one of the things I can recall is how integral to organizing internally of the Otpor movement training was. Uh, as one of the leaders of, of the Otpor movement, I, for months, would spend one day a week training people. Like this was like our internal training program and uh, training in the service of organizing, uh, which means that when you recruit people into the movement, you provide them with necessary skills and like some sort of onboarding from the very first day was essential to the success of our uh, organizing operation. So, so it's kind of, that's my first experience with training. That was more like tactical training, uh, skill building, things like that. Uh, what I can also attest to in the years following the, the, the fall of Milosevic when I was doing a lot of education uh, around the around the world and like not just training myself but actually supporting the establishment and 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 development of training networks and training programs was another thing and that is how uh training in such a strategic and like uh what is it called like a systematic way can actually spread the uh, willingness of the population to engage in acts of civil resistance and movement building uh, meaning they would choose that political option or that political method over some other methods like, you know, uh, filing petitions and begging the, the, the authorities or going down the uh, risky path of, of, of using violence. And training actually helps there. So they select the, 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 that method, not because somebody told them to, but because they can see the options clearly and they can make a strategic choice. So these are the two things that I that I saw where I saw trainings work, both tactic tactically and strategically. Great. That's really helpful, Ivan. Um, Nadine, how about you and your experience, how you've seen uh, training, facilitation, coaching, kind of support movements that are challenging, backsliding or authoritarian resurgence? Yeah, great. I'll echo. It's really wonderful to have this conversation with you all. Um, as a trainer, both um, in uh, in the streets and in nascent movements, as well as uh, in someone who uh, thinks about it academically and from a theoretical perspective, and I've been doing this for decades, as Yvonne said, it's great to be here with us folks who've been in the movement for a while, but I will say just to start off that I work every day with folks who are new to the movement, whether they're young or they're old, and that is perhaps the key to defining what we're talking about when we talk about democracy and the understanding that we have the right or the responsibility to participate in decisions that affect us and determine how our future goes. And I think um, connected to the importance of training and education, political education, training and skills that we need to both communicate and dialogue with each other on a very basic level or training in skills like climbing buildings or driving boats and uh, blockading nuclear ships, all of which I've been involved in. W the most common thing that we encounter is that, as Alice Walker says, the most common way people give up power is by thinking they don't have any. And so the essence of training and education of simply coming together, whether it's through popular education methodologies that start, which is what I really encourage people to do, as well as experiential role-playing methodologies, so that people are deeply invested in their own experiences and how they come to the work, as well as um, speaking truth to power by putting their body on the line, literally in trainings. And so, um, you know, it goes back, I guess, in the in the bigger picture about why we do this work. And it is all for a lot of us about building power and helping people understand their role in building power and both political education and skill building across the spectrum, both internally in our small groups, person-to-person uh, -person communication mechanisms, how to deal with conflict on an individual level, but also dealing with communication between groups. And then, of course, eventually up to what could even be you know, professional negotiation on a level. So 
all of that um, really uh, builds us our, in our ability to work together and to um, deal with risk that comes up in disruptive action, which is in my book necessary in these times for making significant change in a lot of circumstances. Great, thank you very much, Nadine. And I really appreciated what you were both saying about how training helps people to see options, kind of gives them confidence and also helps them realize how much power they actually have. I think that's really helpful. Um, so I now wanna to turn to, to Jake and to Carlos. Um, so what would you both say about how movements can think about training, facilitation, and coaching as a process, like as a building process? Because we talked in kind of our preparation about the content of training and the process. So how, what can you say about the building part of it? So Jake, maybe I'll start with you. All right, I've been given the power to speak. Um, thank you, you Maria. Have. And yeah, just echoing the appreciation to Maria and the whole team, Tabitha, for bringing us in. Looking forward to this conversation. Like some really critical questions right now. Um, good to be with y'all. So, yeah, I, when I thought about the process, I was thinking about this question. I, I think the first place to start, at least the first place I've learned to start, um, is starting with people um, as the center of the thing, rather than sometimes we start with issues, we start with techniques, we start with approaches but starting with people. Um, and if we think about that, then thinking about training spaces or workshop spaces, training is tricky because it sort of sometimes connotes like we're going to put in versus, you know, actually drawing out and building out, which I think is what we often actually mean or want to mean. Um, and so what does it look like when we do that? How do we do it where people are actually experiencing? I think somewhat in the Dean and Yvonne were saying about experiencing agency and how do we build people-centric training spaces? And so thinking about that, we, we've found it helpful to think about training as a place of practices rather than techniques or skills. Um, it's a place where practices are developed. And when we think about practices, there is a skill component, but there's also a conceptual component. There's also a values component. And it's like building a language that people can practice together. Um, and so I think in that way, actually experiencing the training. I'm thinking about a workshop we did in Nicaragua with some young folks who have been working on democracy movements there. And the experience in the space of people, not just feeling individual agency, but collective agency. And if we think about power building is involving collective action, which I think Nadine was naming really clearly, challenge at least in the United States and perhaps in other places as well is we don't do collective very well. And so how do we develop workshop spaces that actually develop this collective capacity, making collaboration the center of it. So actually having workshops where people are broken out in teams and they're practicing and working together, developing deliberative capacity in a team space um, and doing the practices that we all do, that movements all do of telling stories, of building relationships, of developing a real clear structure, of strategizing and of taking action. How do we create the space where people are doing that, learning it, building it? Um, together so they can actually experience it together as not just a workshop as like a one-off thing, but as a foundation for next steps people can take together. Um, and that's something that I've seen really shift people's experience and understanding. It's a cultural building space, not just a skill building space. And in that way, you can feel the democracy muscle being built in the space itself. Um, so yeah, I, I think thinking of the space as we're building what we're trying to build, not just we're achieving what we're trying to achieve, um, if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah, it does. Thank you for that, uh, Jay. Carlos, how about you? Yes. Can people hear me? Is this good? Good. Yes, good. Well, it's good to see everybody. I know I cannot see anyone else, but at least I see my, my teammates here on the on the panel. I'm glad to be here. Um, well, I don't know what else to, I mean, I'll add maybe two things. I know everyone is saying some awesome things. I mean, the first thing that I'll add is that in some ways, um, to me, training and development of people, developing of capacities is kind of essential to build power. And what I mean by this is that, you know, I'm part of the immigrant rights movement and there's 11 million people that don't have papers. There's even within the population, some people that have, you know, I meet now people that have been in this situation for 30 plus years that they've been a document. I mean, we have, a, it's, it's, a, it's an intense uh, problem that we have. And right now I can go meet with Biden, kind of as Ivan is saying, and I can see, go bring a bus to DC and say, hey, why don't you, 
give me immigration reform. And, you know, if it's Trump or Republicans, they will tell me to screw myself or whatever. But if it's the Dems, they will be like, well, Carlos, we care. You know, you're amazing. We love you. But not now. You know, it's the Republicans, you know, even if they have that majority. So then we understand that this is a problem of power. And, and disenfranchisement, this being disenfranchised and not having decision making and democracy, because you're you're alienated, you're excluded from society, you know. And I think that to me, training is kind of like a no-brainer because as if you're thinking of organizing people, well, how the hell are you gonna organize people if you don't invest significant amount of resources in training? And I say this because sometimes I talk to people and groups that were coaching and stuff. And people plan some amazing actions, some amazing work. And, and they always tell me, and I said, can you do a one or two day training? And they're always saying they don't have the time. We don't have the capacity. We don't have. And I'm like, this is so central, so central to the thing. And I think it's so central one, because you do have to build power and you have to train people about what that means. And that's, you know, training around skills, training around uh, capacities, training about personal development. You know, I know with Jake, we, we work with, uh, we were trained by Marshall Gantz and the development of your narrative and your story and so forth and so on. So I think to me first, it's just like, it, it's so important because you just have to take hundreds of thousands of people through a basically an empowerment workshop, seminars, trainings, experiences, and you have to have good ex teaching experience, right? Of course, the education system sucks. You know, I recently went back to my old high school and remember how bad high, my public high school is, you know? So whatever they're doing in public education, you know, in the worst places, if we do the opposite, we're probably going to be doing something right. So that's the first thing that I'll say. And I think the second thing that I'll say, and this is something that I learned from Yvonne and, uh, and also from Marshall Gantz, is that we just have to develop mass training. And what I mean by that is like, look, you know, there's 300 whatever million people in the United States and every day and every week there's an activist or someone that wants to get trained. And training is so important because everyone has this enthusiastic beginner kind of thing, which is like, I'm an enthusiastic beginner and I want to change the world. And we all go through that. Like I went through that when I wanted to rollerblade skates in Peru. And then I, you know, fell on my ass a hundred times. And then I said, basically, Roller skates are not for me. There's roller skates people, and then there's me and all the other ones that we can. But it's not true. It's a question of craft. If I practice, I can figure out, uh, you know, that practice. And I feel like there's so many enthusiastic beginners out there that leave the movements because they don't have training. And I think to me, the basic question for all training institutes and organizations, if we're doing training, is if somebody wants to get a training this weekend, do we have a training available for them? And I think that's the challenge of mass training that we have. Yeah, no, that's um, really an important insight. And there's been a lot of discussion about, especially in this context, there was a lot of talk before the last election about mass trainings and who was providing them online, offline, you know, what, whatever the topic, upholding democracy, preventing a coup. And now what is the state of that mass training now and how are we preparing for it? So that's a really, really helpful insight. Um, well, so I, I now wanted to ask the panelists uh, kind of a second round question which is that your training, facilitation, and coaching work um, has been across various movement groups, coalitions, and organizations, which I think gives you a really unique vantage point uh, from which to look at the larger ecosystem of social change actors. So what do you see as being the key challenges and or missed opportunities um, that you see groups facing in their work to mobilize and promote kind of resilience across the ecosystem, particularly in this context of like kind of attacks on democracy, um, rising authoritarianism. And, you know, can you offer a few examples of that as well? So maybe we'll go back to Yvonne. Thanks. So this is actually a, a critical, critical question. And I, I kind of said earlier, like uh, about training in the service of organizing and, and, and then that organizing in the, is in the service of politics, you know, because if we don't, uh, how shall I say, deal with politics, it will deal with us. Uh, and uh, so I, I'm just gonna go back to what Jake said when he said, it's not just about skills, it's also about concepts and values. And, you know, like, you know, or, or as uh, Rudolf Steiner said, when he was developing the Waldorf school, you have to teach the hands, the mind and the heart. You know, and 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 this is why we have to kind of when we look at the training, we are actually uh, building power by building internal 
power of citizens by, uh, how shall I say, uh, addressing all these three levels, hearts, minds, and, and, and hands, skills, concepts, and, and values. And I, I've seen a lot of uh, mistakes being done by, by movements who are organizing their internal program, and then they don't capture all three. So for instance, they would skip, for instance, skills, and then they would try to kind of work on values in the vacuum, you know, like, oh, we need to kind of develop uh, people's political or class consciousness or whatever it is. Uh, or they would focus on like, oh, how do we run a very good campaign and how do we equip people, but but not really work on the on the values part and the concepts part also, because, you know, that is that is that is uh, the third thing. So integrating all these three elements and like practicing values, using uh, those values then to kind of reach certain conclusions on the levels of concepts, circling back into uh, action and uh, and creating that uh, connection is actually why we need to have like an integrated training program. We cannot have one-off trainings. And this is where I think uh, the, the nexus between uh, like training organizations or training institutes or uh, how should I say individuals who are, who are running trainings and movements needs to be established where these training organizations who specialize in trainings, a lot of us are, are doing that. We need to help movements build their own internal training programs. They cannot rely on us or outsiders to do trainings. When they build their own internal uh, programs, then they can actually create that balance between the values that they're fighting for, the concepts that they are promoting that are necessary for, for, for the political activation of citizens and the skills that are also important for those citizens who take part in that to, how should I say, participate actively. Because let me tell you, like I'm now with the International Center on Nonviolent Conflict and people who come to us are movement geeks. These are people who are interested in movements. They're interested in civil resistance. So they will come and ask for, uh, how should I say, any kind of support or research or resources on, on, on organizing, on movement building, whatever. If people are interested in, uh, climate change, they're not going to come to us, they're going to come to a climate change address. If they're interested in democracy, they're going to come to a democracy address. If they're interested in, in uh, I don't know, like uh, fighting corruption, there is an address for that. So these addresses, these movements, these groups uh, working on these issues, when they build their effective training programs, then they turn citizens into uh, like the most powerful uh, arm of 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 the struggle because unlike the elites who rely on material resources to win the day the only resource that we as people can count on is ourselves and that's the human resources and this is why research of some of the people on this uh, uh, in this room showed that participation of citizens is the key most important predictor of the movement success and Participation through training actually is even more effective. Mm, yeah, I like that. Um, the important, yeah, just the, how you're building numbers. And we talk about the primacy of participation and how training builds a participation and diverse participation movements is so important. Nadine, how about you? Like um, challenges and or missed opportunities that you've witnessed to kind of promote resilience across the ecosystem? We only have two minutes. Oh my goodness. Well, yes. <laughs> yeah. So let's see, just a quick overview. I agree, of course, with everything that Yvonne has said. And um, I will say like one of the reasons I'm committed to training and facilitation and in particular facilitation is because if you think about the most radical thing you can do or in the root sense of the word radical, it is to help people navigate and be effective at good process, which is the essence of participating in your future. And so I do. we do spend a lot of time teaching people and helping people understand how to be better facilitators who can make sure to um, hear from everyone involved in a room, whether you're in a training or a meeting, and as well um, help people understand good decision-making processes, whether they're um, whatever version of consensus or consent-based processes happen. Um, and 
Um, I will make a note that, you know, the issue around education is not just on the left. It's, it's widely uh, mainstreamed. We do not support education or educators broadly in our culture. And this trickles into the left. Um, and so we often hear, yeah, we don't have time. We're too crazy, busy, whatever. Really what happens, people are interested in training when they don't have time for it, when they're in the middle of a campaign. Very, uh, we are constantly skilling up or down. Just before the big Seattle protests around the International Monetary Institutes in 99, there were no trainers. We had to go into massive train the trainer mode. And um, we see just like we did that before the 2020 election here, massive train the trainer mode. And you know, I work on the ground with a number of groups in DC, shut down DC, giving them a shout out. We are committed and developing online simulation games to help people understand how training can be accessible and help groups be more effective in figuring out strategically what to do meeting people where they're at. So we have that other challenge right now of COVID. Still, some people are not interested in getting together in person. We need to overcome that on the left as people who are more likely to not be in person as opposed to right-wingers who uh, eschewed all that wisdom in the beginning. We have left folks still not out in public. So we need to really address that and, and deliver workshops and trainings where they're at. And then I will say we have to address this challenge of the urgency of the work that we do, where we need to stop the problem, say no to real harm that's happening and say yes to building the future. And that is why, as Jake mentioned, we do build containers or communities within our training and educational spaces, within our organizing spaces that help people build relationships that keep them in the struggle, that address in, you know, make, helping people understand both their political power how to organize, how to facilitate, how to climb buildings, how to blockade, whatever it is, but as well build the community that will help address any risk that they might face, the fears of going to jail, fears of losing friends, fears of losing income, whatever those specific things are. So it's that idea of, uh, I know Maria, you, you always say blocking and building. We say, you know, the ability of, of saying a hard no and having your hand out reached with uh, Barbara Deming's image. And, uh, figuring out how to build the joy and relationship building into the work that we do so that um, people do keep coming back. Now, we do a really good job, I think, in some level of very basic intro prep uh, trainings and workshops on a variety of issues. We do a higher level, as Yvonne said, we get the geeks who really geek out on some of this stuff. I'm included in that. And then it's the middle level folks who suffer from not having less access to professional development, if you will. And um, it's something to think about as we understand and realize the strategic impact of effective training and education that we need to build that capacity. Yeah, that's great, um, Nadine. Um, Jake, how about your thoughts on challenges, opportunities? Yeah, I am um, have so many thoughts coming up and appreciating the way this is cascading and building. Um, I think maybe one challenge that I've seen, and it seems to be cut across a lot of groups. I guess there's two. One is that it seems like there are a lot of theories of change based on mobilization rather than organization building. Um, and I was thinking about the metal. I'm a soccer player, love soccer. And it's as if you would imagine a soccer team just practicing scoring goals, like shooting goals, all practice. That would not be a good soccer team. The purpose is to score a goal in a soccer game. But there's all this buildup work, this adaptability, you have to be able to prepare for those moments. And it seems like we're often focused on, okay, let's go and score that goal. And there's this mobilization where lots of people get involved and then lots of people fall off. I think others have suggested this as well. Um, and that question of how do we build trainings, not as a separate thing, but as an effort to build organization, organizing related to organization. And I think that's the second challenge perhaps. Um, where a lot of groups don't seem well equipped in their process of strategizing to root it in an assumption that their people are the base of their power. Um, and so the question of how are organizations being built in a way that facilitates that, if that's what we're thinking, versus what often happens where there's a few people who are full-time paid folks who are coming up with all the strategy and then trying to get everyone to mobilize it behind it. 
and we're seeing the limits of that. And so I think if you experience organization as being part of the problem rather than the solution, it gets tricky. And I think there's a challenge there where often that's the case. And so that's the way in which I think training spaces can be spaces where people experience organization and structure as being creating space, right? Structure is often seen as how do we, well, structure, that's going to close us down. But actually, of course, we know that having structure is what gives us the space to be creative, being clear about where the boundaries are, where the edges are. And so thinking about trainings in that way, I think it is really helpful in thinking about authority and space creation and structure. Um, that how do we use authority not to be authoritative, but actually to create space? and to invite people not to have all the answers, but to ask some really critical questions. So it's not this like either I'm the boss and I tell everyone what to do, but it's also not the opposite, which often happens, which is like, what does everybody think? Well, let's just do what everybody thinks. And that's really abdicating any real leadership and responsibility. And so how do we create training spaces where people are practicing the muscle of holding authority with clear questions that invite space and structure for people to then build? And then what does it look like? I think what Ivana was saying was really, really critical. And Nadine as well, I think was re referencing this. How are organizational, how are um, training programs built towards building organization? So that there's a way in which the pedagogy matches the kind of organization we want to build. So if we're trying to build an organization with distributed authority and responsibility, well, what if our training structure had that in it as well, where we're saying, okay, there's 10 people who are going to hold authority in different spaces here, and we're going to distribute that in a way and, and have support. So I think those are a few things that, yeah, it's challenges and maybe ways of addressing them, though it's, it's tricky. I mean, these are all really big challenges. Yeah, for sure. But really important ones on how to think about building trainings to build organization. Um, Carlos, how about you? Kind of forgot what I was going to say because I'm learning so much from Ivan, Nadine, and Jake. This is some good good combo here. I'm grateful that I got to get to go last, but also get disoriented because I'm going through my own experience here with what they're saying. Well, I mean, I think uh, what I see as some, uh, maybe some uh, challenges and um uh, that I mean, I don't know if I could add anything different from what the team has already added that I think is important. I mean, th there is one area, which is, are we doing good education? Which is a whole conversation. You know, if it's experience focus, if it's it has breadth, and it has depth. Uh, you know, I'm always amazed at the at the movement of landless peasants in Brazil, the MST, because you know their their shorter training is six weeks. Yet, so I think that I think one of the, the maybe the biggest challenges I have is with uh, as standards or expectations of how much training you need. So because in some ways, to me, it feels like that is actually the battle that most organizations need to do with their leaders, which is to commit leaders to a process of formation. And it's, you know, I, I agree with you. There's some people that are just want most people don't want to train. Some people just want to do training on skills because they have a rapid campaign. But really, what we need is a long term investment in formation. And being honest that this stuff is going to take time to really learn about power, to really learn some core skills, you know, like we can teach people how to coordinate, but you have to coordinate to learn how to coordinate. And that's going to take time and it's going to take a process. It's going to take a team and peers, so forth and so on. So I think formation is really important because, you know, it's, it's sad to say this, but I think it's important to say that sometimes some people are not committed to craft. Mm. And, mm -hmm. and, and sometimes people think that the training space needs to eliminate the tension of life, the tension of rejection, the tension of, you know, it, that's just an age. So sometimes training spaces try to get things to be very different. There's a need for having space that listens to people and stuff, but there's a different, that's not just the training. That's just the training space. The experience and the tension, that both the action, the campaigning, going to door knocking is training. And getting rejected and, and dealing with the tensions of the world, because that's basically what training is, right? It's like if we train people to hold on violence, you kind of want to agitate them in the role play like crazy so that when the actual agitating happens, they have a better reaction. So one thing that I see is sometimes we take this tension away from training. This, mm. this, this, this is the center of the training is the tension. And sometimes trainers want to baby people and stuff. There's nothing wrong with being respectful, but I think sometimes we don't train people on the tensions that happen, but also on that formation that it's going to take. Hey, look, you want to get good at this campaigning? It's going to take some time, right? Let's get, of course, there's levels, level one, level two, you can say, but it's going to take some time. And I think that goes to Ivan's uh, point that we need to develop internal training programs because organizations need to be able to hold that, right? They, they need to hold the formation process because that's a community that people are relating with. And the only last 
thing that I would say that I see over and over, we do, we think there's the problem with training is that there's five different theories of change that people are using in training. Some people are training people to be inside gamers and to be advocacy and lobbying. Some people are training people to do community organizing. Some people are training people to do mass protests. Some people are training to do personal transformation, healing work. Uh, some people are training people to do cooperatives. So there's a variety of different theories and approaches that people are training on. And what happens, I think one big challenge is that we don't have a meta language to explain how all those things have a value and have a role. And because of that, people in the trainings, whether it's by organization or training institutes, get oriented as some things are better than others, but actually don't understand how the whole ecosystem relates and what's actually the strengths or weaknesses of each approach. Yes, um, preach. Um, well, so we actually made our way through the two rounds of questions and we do have time for a third question if everybody is able to be uh, fairly brief. So you all are part of all these amazing uh, training, coaching, facilitation networks. Are there ideas that you have for ways to kind of enhance collaboration, if you will, or ways to come together more effectively to bring various actors together across the ecosystem? So maybe if you all can offer one minute responses with some initial thinking, that would be great. Sorry, I know that's short. Uh, so Yvonne, back to you. We'll go in our order. Okay, that's a great question. Let me try to put it in one minute. Uh, so what Carlos said, like these five different theories of change, I mean, there are like five different, six different maybe even, uh, you know, ways people see like power and power, uh, uh, how is power built? How is po how power shifts? Uh, what is the role of organizing? And then the training and like, what do we do also changes. And I think, you know, like the more I spend time in this field, the more I see that like none of us is correct uh, or like exclusively correct in our uh, view of, of, of how power works and what's the theory of change. And I think this, this kind of, uh, uh, in, like let's like say exchange or interaction on these different models is actually essential for us to see the shortcomings of our own model and also to kind of uh, supplement it with like these uh, like elements of other models. So I think that's, that's probably the, the, the first step. Is it, was it a minute? Yeah. I mean, perfect. Thanks, Yvonne. Uh, Nadine. Oh, great. Um, I mean, training and education in and of itself can be used strategically to bring groups together, right? You can strategically think about bringing dispersed organizing models, dispersed issue areas together to do work and do that with an intention to increase relationship building and the capacity for them to come together and work together collectively at some point. Um, but, and, but um, it also is a, is a, can, <laughs> the ability of us to do that um, is more, I think, about helping people understand strategy and if you like introduce people to a tool like spectrum of allies and if they actually think about how we win which is not by screaming and yelling all the time at our arch enemies but by shifting likely candidates or people who are you know friends and passive not taking action closer to taking action etc then it makes it clear that working across issue areas, across theories of change, across organizing strategies, that it is a strategically beneficial choice. And I think that is, that's what I'll say about that. <laughs> yes, I love that. Um, just like helping with the strategic thinking and planning process um, in training is critically important. Um, so how about we turn things over to Jake? Yeah, sure. No, I think I'm resonating with what everyone's saying. I think in a way, I guess I'm trained as an organizer. I consider myself an organizer. So I think of it as an organizing challenge. And so I guess the thing that I would consider doing is organizing a collective bargaining agreement with the funders. Um, because everyone's getting funding. I mean, the deal is, I mean, we're talking about everyone nice, but everyone's got this pressure, right? I mean, the one source of power is the funding. And being real about it, everyone wants their own thing because that's where the, that's how you get funding, right? It's I mean, it's set up this way. It's structurally set up this way. It's not a criticism of any individual. And so it would be hard to get together. It'd be a real organizing challenge. But what would it look like to demand that funders create a democracy fund, right? That's actually supporting that. We're talking a lot about the need for long-term investment. For, and then we're also talking about the challenge of people 
just going on to the, the moment to moment needs and, and those are real. And so how do we balance that in a way that's intentional and not, yeah, that recognizes the structural elements of this. Um, there was this recent piece by uh, Muhammad Ali Kad Kadiver. I'm not sure y'all may know him better, but about the length of a democratic institution dependent on how long the revolution was that created it in some ways. There was a, a direct correlation because it gave time for organization to be built. And so this yeah. question of how are we creating time for organization to be built without yeah, being reactive to funders cycles. And yeah, so that, that's what I'd say. Let's organize. That's great. Um, Carlos, take us home. Holy moly. I mean, I would say to me, what it would be interested training institutes. I don't know. I mean, we're a train, little training institute and we always live out of nothing. And I know there's a lot of training institutes that are, nobody thinks about training institutes. We don't even have space to do trainings, most training spaces, you know, so they're very underfunded, under resourced. But I think there's something we can do within that, which I think it would be great to commit a part of our budget, whether it's 3%, 4%. Uh, to be able to develop a hotline or a capacity for us to know what actually are the trainings that are happening out there. Because we get so many requests, hey, we need a training on this. We're a little, we cannot train on everything. No training institute can train on everything. We have to depend on it. But sometimes we don't even know who's doing what. So I think there's, you know, now with technology and so many things, it would be great for, you know, 10, 12 training institutes to form a little alliance not to share curriculum because that takes so long and everyone fights because they think that they're writing whatever, which is okay. That's, I think, our role to, to feel that we have some right parts, right? But I think part of the investment is to say, look, everyone needs training and it's better to do training. And as long as you trust the people, is there a way that we know what trainings are happening every weekend or every month so that we can send people to the right thing if there's something happening? Having a person that could be a hotline, 1-800 training, whatever that we can People can call from organizations. Do you have a training on facilitation this weekend? Because when you have a leader that wants to learn and wants to do it, you have to train them now. <laughs> Sometimes we miss the timing. So something like that, I think might be useful. No, that's great. And I hope Gabe Lerner on, on the Horizons team is listening because Gabe was part of an effort before the 2020 election to compile all the known trainings that were happening in the nonviolent action, peace building, violence prevention, coalition building, listening, like, so it was all in one spreadsheet. And we've been discussing maybe keeping that updated or like, you know, adding uh, other training opportunities. So anyway, I love, I love those ideas. So, and just to answer, there's a really vibrant conversation going on in the chat, which is, which is awesome. We are going to be able to save the chat. And we would also invite folks before I turn things over to our respondent, Reverend Green, if people have questions that they'd like to address to the panelists, please uh, type them in the Q&A, which is uh, distinct from the chat, as many of you know. So please uh, start to think about and maybe type out your questions, which we'll uh, turn to after uh, we hear from Reverend Green and also our organizing fellow. So Reverend Green, what are your reflections on the conversation that we've had till now? Well, thank you again uh, for hosting this conversation and moderating Maria and to the Horizons team for convening. This has been a truly an impactful and uh, historic conversation as we uh, meet in the intersection of this crisis that we're facing uh, as a nation. I think that it is uh, important to note that this conversation is happening in between uh, a attempted coup and in between a midterm election that would sort of determine the future of this democracy. And so I want to uh, suggest that this is happening in a very important and incredible moment. Uh, and I want to just say that as we talk about training and strategy, it grounds us in this collective vision of courageous uh, action uh, and this uh, idea that there is something that we all as human agents can do to shape and build a better and more perfect union for all of us to inhabit. And so uh, that is what grounds all of the trainings that I've, I've heard about, uh, the perspectives that each one of us brings to the table as how do we develop and strengthen love warriors to be on the front line, to be engaged in uh, radical love and action, to do the work, to build uh, a fair and just society, to build a true democracy in this nation. Uh, and I want to just uh, highlight that our courageous vision and our courageous action are all grounded in the philosophy of love. Um, and that is what motivates 
uh, every trainer, every activist, every organizer, every every person who was engaged in the beautiful trouble, this beautiful struggle uh, for love and democracy is this intersection of a, of a phenomenon that unites the universe, that grounds all human personality, that helps us to be able to see beyond the walls of division. And so I just want to encourage uh, the activists, the organizers, the trainers, those who are fearlessly fighting over the next 50 days to uh, work towards a more perfect union and beyond those days, beyond November the 8th, because we know that the work does not end on November the 8th, uh, but that we consistently are committed to this courageous love and action, to this radical love and action as an underlying principle that recognizes the worth and the depth of all human personality so that we can truly build uh, a fair and just beloved community. So I want to thank you, thank these panelists for encouraging us. I'm excited by 1-800 training, uh, looking forward to our collective strategies to come together uh, to build uh, the world we all wish to live in. Thank you so much, Reverend Green, um, and really appreciated your focus on grounding all of this work in um, a philosophy of courageous love and action. And I should have noted too, in introducing you that you're also a Kingy and nonviolence trainer. And so those principles are so um, firmly embedded in the approach um, in training of Kingy and nonviolence um, that I think it's such an important reminder of the foundation of this work. Um, so we're now going to uh, start the discussion uh, with you all. And I've invited uh, Simon Bayangana, uh, who is um, uh, an organizing fellow with the Horizons Project. We're thrilled to have Simon on the team. And Simon is a community organizer based in Uganda. He's a member of Solidarity Uganda. He's also a member of the Leading Change Network, kind of Africa Hub, member of the RISE Coaching Network. So he's been doing a lot of leadership movement building uh, trainings and organizing for many years. And so we just invited uh, Simon to maybe kick off our Q&A with like, the questions that are going through his head right now as he's kind of been hearing the, the, the discussion we've had till now. So Simon, over to you. And then again, I invite folks to continue to put your questions uh, in the Q&A part and then we'll tee those up afterwards. Simon. Well, uh, thank you very much, Maria, for this opportunity. And thank you for this interesting discussion. I think it's a discussion that uh, cuts across the entire globe. It's not only like looking at the US from my perspective, I'm seeing it at a more international level because at the end of it all is that education and training is something that helps us to build capacity. I mean, some of the questions that are running in my head as um, a student of civil resistance, I'm actually a student of Ivan. I've, 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 I've done some work with him, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering how can movements, uh, how can movements, how can dissidents, activists uh, build their internal training programs, which can actually be effective to, to support them in their needs? I'm asking this relating to the fact that I work with so many movements across Africa but the challenge is that sometimes even when we try when we try to train these movements, measuring the impact is always a problem. Yeah. It's it's like when you call people for like a training or you're training people, sometimes it's 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 more of an education session. And at the end of the day, as a trainer, you find challenges in ways that you can feel that you can uh, measure these kinds of training. And also maybe a quick question to Carlos is that there's a time we had a training with, uh, with, uh, with Ivan in Uganda and when he left the room, the students were inspired to go and do actions, but it is not something that they would do. They feel they should, they would, they would do it in one day, but the tension was so high, yeah? So I'm relating to what you said, how do we manage these tensions whereby even they can feel that this is something that can take time in order to build or in order to work on. So I'm wondering how are we going to support them strategically to think that, you know what, 
it takes a time, it takes a process, even when you feel you are energized now to go and do something about it. Yeah. Otherwise, thank you very much. It's, it's really been a very good opportunity to be part of this discussion and also uh, a platform to ask some of these relevant questions as we build um, sustainable movements. Because without education and training, I think many activists, many organizers resort to ineffective means of change such as violence and, and, and fail to capitalize on their people power potential. Yeah, thank you. No, that's great. Thanks very much, Simon. And I, you know, your question about like kind of the, the specifics of how to develop an internal training program. So I heard that as a theme, just being such an important facet of like, you know, truly making it um, locally owned and sustainable. Like what are the specific specifics of doing that? And then I heard you asking about measuring impact. So like, how do you know a training program is succeeding? And maybe we can start, um, does someone on the panel want to kind of take the first one about developing an internal training program and then maybe someone else can address the, the question of like how you assess progress. I'm happy to speak on the, the first question. I know Nadine has a lot of experience with its training for trainer element as well. So maybe I, I'll say it briefly and Nadine can add or others as well. But I mean, hi, Simon. Good to see you again today. <laughs> Simon is part of a program we're doing on public narrative coaching. And I, I mean, I guess one way I've thought about it and we've learned is thinking of the trainings as cascaded efforts. Um, so I'm thinking of the experience, actually, Carlos, we have a number of experiences like this, but Carlos and I were part of an effort um, back in 2009 when Obama had first been elected and there was a moment of opportunity around, um, yeah, big immigration reform and there were questions on what, what it was going to look like. And there are all these young folks who were really energized about making real change happen. And we started with 14 young folks in two states, 14 each of two states, who we trained as coaches. And then they were they recruited folks, um, so this is Florida and Colorado, they each recruited 10, five to 10 people. And so we ended up with a next cohort of 100 plus in each state, who then they served as coaches for. And this all happened in a month period. Um, folks were clearly ready, but they got them in the room and those trainings then led to actions that were not just put out on Twitter, on Facebook, or I don't even know if Twitter existed back then, but Facebook did but actions that were done by individual like teams within those. So each, each coach launched their own team that took a responsibility for a part of the state or a part of the constituency and then recruited people to those actions. And it helped set the foundation for sustained work, which I mean, there's still work going on, but culminated in some ways with DACA and other things. I and mean, Carlos knows a lot more about the internal strategy work, but there was a way in which it can be cascaded. I mean, that's how I think about how do you get to scale is not just how do we get a lot of people in there, but how do we invest in people who can then take responsibility for the next cohort of people. And that way it can go, you know, it can get to very, very big numbers if you have the capacity and the energy for it. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's great. Nadine, you may have some thoughts and Yvonne, what's going through my head now is kind of recruit, train, act like this, this uh, model. Let's see, this is the one thing that I retain from hearing your, your stories of trading all these years. So Nadine or Yvonne, do you want to, you want to go next? Go oh, ahead. Okay. So it's actually act, recruit, train. Oh and my God. Why. Look at, I screwed I'll it up. I'll explain why. I'll uh, explain why. Because people usually think that action is the climax of our organizing. So we recruit people, we train them, and yes. then they act. And when they act, we make an impact. But the art model, which we developed in Otpor back in the day, turned this upside down. So what we did is act, recruit, train. So action, the purpose of action is recruitment. It's not, we don't recruit and train people to act. We actually organize action to recruit people and to train them. And so these three elements are action happens where people are. So we don't do to the cent we don't go to the central square to protest. We go to neighborhoods, we go to small towns, we organize street actions where people are. Why? In order to recruit them. Because if you don't go into the street to recruit people, you're going to recruit in your existing network, which is kind of the same people. Second thing, uh, recruit. 
recruitment goes through cohorts. You don't recruit people individually, you recruit them in the community as friends, as neighbors. So they're gonna join the movement together, they're gonna stay together. And then train is actually preparing them to take a ne next action. So that was the cycle that, that, that we did. That was the element of the, or, uh, the most important element of our internal training program is Otpor. And I think it helped us like grow to a number of like 80,000 activists in a, in a, actually Nadine in, in the, in that report that, that you put like earlier in the chat, this is one of the uh, training programs that you feature in that report amongst others. And maybe you should talk about some of the others uh, as well, which are, are actually really interesting. Yeah, I mean, we have such a short amount of time and um, I like the chat moment. There are no shortcuts and we do need to figure out I mean, there's this basic level of strategy about why we are doing anything. Before this call, we shared stories about how there were giant mobilizations, the Women's March in the U.S. comes to mind, where there was very little follow-up. And we don't actually know whether strategically they made that decision that they weren't going to do follow-up, or whether they did make a decision and they failed to act on it, or whether it never even was a question. And, um, you know, in the United States and plenty of places around the world, we look at the labor movement or syndicate organizing around the world for great examples of follow-up and the need to do what we call one-on-one. -on -one. Somebody shows up, who's going to call them? Who's going to follow up with them? And if you can do the multi-level marketing scheme that Yvonne promotes, which is very great, or, or that um, Jake talked about, people bringing the friends that they know, that is great. And also, we need to figure out a way, and there are some online tools as well as person-to-person -person contact, which are always effective in making sure that people are not just asked to come back, but they're asked to come back with a purpose and a thing that makes it compelling. And um, I, it, it, this, this part is really, really, it, it's, it's really important that we plan this. I mean, I, it, like anything, you want to plan your training, you want to figure out even the basics of logistics. Can you get into the space when you need to get into the space? Are you going to provide for pay people's food? Um, and, you know, certainly, um, as the Reverend Green said, like, are we going to take care of the whole person while they're there? What will bring them to the place and bring them back again? And so um, we really do the difference between organizing and mobilizing. Um, that is a, always a conversation within our trainings and educational spaces, the understanding of what it means to have structures and processes in place so that we don't lose people in that moment. I mean, this is all really critical. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, no, that, that's great. And I'm wondering, Carlos, do you have um, any reaction to that? Otherwise, we're going to turn to the first two questions that we have. You want to keep going? All right, awesome. So the first question that I'm seeing in the Q&A is, how can we find and engage the enthusiastic beginners in the work of organizing? Um, I can't remember what targeted to one in particular, Carlos and Nadine, but if anyone feels inspired to answer, have at it. Carlos, since you didn't go last round, why don't you kick us off? But Nadine was gonna go. Um... <laughs> I'm not sure. What do you think, Nadine? You go first if you if you have thoughts. <laughs> I feel there's not an easy answer, right? So the enthusi the one thing that we have found incredibly effective on a very day to day level is that if somebody shows up who's really excited, somebody follows up with them a one on one. It could be a text, it can be a phone call, it can be a, an email, but it doesn't really matter that personal point of connection if they're not already connected with somebody else. And that's excruciating. Like, let's be clearly honest. Like we're not, it's hard to make that happen at a very fast mass scale in an urgent situation. But some of this, this work needs to happen long-term. This is the basis for community building, community power building. And um, it, yeah, I, I think that's, that's the way it is. But the other thing that I wanna challenge here is that we do know from some people's work on this call, Maria and others, that. Uh, no, it is somewhat of a numbers game, right? We do need to make it more, the bar lower to joining. And whether it's people feel that that it's nonviolent and they could actually do something creative or within the realm of not picking up a weapon, whether we need to make sure that it comes to their local neighborhood, like Yvonne was saying, whether it's because their good friend is participating, the bar needs to be as low as possible. And 
um, we need to invest in that very clearly uh, so that we can do it. And still a lot of the work that we do can happen with smaller numbers. Like sometimes the focus on expanding our numbers is uh, happens too early in the process. Like um, I will say some of the core organizing now around developing you know, principles and values for working together and value in um, establishing trust. You know, um, Adrian Marie Brown and others have talked about um, change happens at the speed of trust and what that means going forward. So we can do some significant both direct actions with small numbers as well as set the stage for larger numbers to come in. That's really critical. Yeah, great. And just emphasizing the like one-on-ones are like just the heart blood of organizing and like the essence of organizing at the end of the day. Carlos, did you have any reflections on after hearing that? Um, I mean, I think there's nothing like a very good training to get people really excited. Like some good training, you know, being in a space where people are being vulnerable, you know, coming from the immigrant experience you know, hearing that someone is undocumented, you, you, would, you would think that in an 11 million people community, that that would be something that happens every day, but it doesn't. People do not share, even if they are undocumented with each other, they do not share that the difficulties that that entails. So I think there's something very powerful about grounding, you know, uh, in narrative and stories and sharing and doing storytelling that is not necessarily about performance, meaning about recruiting others to join you, but it's actually just about sharing. It's about, hey, this is an issue. How do we hold the grief of the moment we're in? And I think breaking that narrative and breaking that gets people really rooted, which I think that's really what we're trying to do is root people in something longer because everyone wants something quick, you know? The change is gonna happen, the mobilization is gonna happen. Well, and we're gonna be like, yes, we need to move quick at times, but we need to be rooted in the long term. Um, so, you know, that's why I like trainings and that's why I'm in this call because I've been to that when I was in despair. Good training is just like, it saves people. It's just the experience of the group, you know, learning something or something breaking your head because you think you know something. And then you don't know shit. And then it's like, oh, fuck, this trainers know. And I didn't know there were Jedis in this whole thing. And it's, it's most people don't know these things. You yeah. know, most people don't know that there's even this field. Yes, exactly. I mean, this is one of the resounding themes that I'm hearing so far is just like the underappreciated importance of long-term investment in training and who's doing it. Is, are the funding models like adapted to support like collaborative long-term investments in training? In your example of the MST, the landless peasants movement, like you said the, the shortest training was six weeks. Did I hear that right? I mean, that's that already says something. Um, so I'm gonna turn to the next question that I saw in the chat, which um, maybe uh, Yvonne and Jake, you can take the initial stab at. So the question is, what are the most important skills and concepts to be able to train and organize across countries, cultures, and places? It's a big question. Ooh, there's something I learned from, uh, I, and actually I learned at the Training for Change in Philadelphia with George Lakey back in like, that was like 20 years ago. And so we were doing like a big uh, super T, like, uh, uh, and, and you know, like that was my kind of first crack at like that kind of type of, uh, of adult learning and facilitation. And, and, uh, and it boils down to this uh, maxim, let go and let group. And that is, I think, very important for, especially if you're doing like uh, training in, in the village that is not your own, <laughs> where you know you kind of have to understand that like the wisdom that exists in the group is not very accessible to you as an outsider, and that you have to trust that. And that means that like as a trainer, you are there to be like a, you know like somebody from out of town and like somebody who can kind of tell them to do things that you know they otherwise wouldn't push them out of their comfort zone, like do, uh, have them do something silly. But at the end of the day, you have to allow that wisdom to uh, show itself because this is what where the learning actually happens. They are like, you know, they have everything. Uh, it's just that like, you know, they need a little bit of like time and they need space. 
to let this all out. And I've seen a lot of uh, people who try to play the role of a of an expert. And you know, like when they're called in, they need to bring something. You know, uh, oh, I'm like, and I used to do that like a long time ago, but I don't do this anymore. And and that is probably you know one of the most important things that I've learned over the years. Let go and let group. Let go and let group. I like that. Um, Jake, how about you? Yeah, I appreciate that. I and mean, I think I would just add to and maybe build on, I think there's a tension, right? It's like, how do you create creative tension with people? It's because I, I, I think maybe that's what you're speaking to, Yvonne, in a certain way of, so when we think about how we're, like, we're coming in, we're not just blank canvases, we do have perspectives, but how do we create creative tension? So it, it doesn't go all the way one way or the other. Um, I've, I've experienced the limits of saying, oh, the group just has all the wisdom. Well, yes, and we also have some experience. And so how do we create a, like a real positive tension with that? Um, yeah, and to the question of, I mean, there's so many, pre we, you know, we have in the Lean Change Network in Marshall's world, we have these five practices that we teach in the culture. But I think the thing I've learned to look for is that in any movement, any situation, there's always whether it's explicit or implicit, it always exists. And the question of how do we make it explicit is maybe part of the work of workshop spaces. There's always a story. There's always three things, a story. Why are we doing what we're doing? And are we able to be mindful and intentional about how we're bringing a story forward? Um, not just the source of motivation. Yes, it's source of motivation, but also of humanity. I think what um, Reverend Green was speaking about, like how do we actually connect to each other as people who've gone through experiences, had experiences? Then there's a strategy. Um, how are we gonna go about achieving this why? And paying real attention to that, not just being reactive. So often we get in reactive mode of let's just respond to what the other side is doing, but how are we proactive? How are we strategizing along the way and thinking about using our resources in creative new ways? I know that's something that Nadine is very thoughtful about, like creative use of resources. How do we get really explicit about that? And then structure, which is the one I mentioned earlier, and I think maybe is most often forgotten or push back against we don't need structure but structure what is the structure that's going to facilitate us to develop that strategy or to carry it out where do we need the teams where do we need the capacity how are we going to go about building that capacity and what does it look like how do we actually distribute responsibility who makes decisions based on what authority um real critical questions that that creates the internal democratic muscles and we're, we're talking about democracy right it's a broader theme here of but perhaps it'd be useful in, in, to have more opportunities for real explicit decision-making structures within organizations, which doesn't mean, okay, well, the people decide and everyone should just have, it's just being explicit and clear about it and intentional about it. And so those three questions, I think, perhaps are questions that need to be asked across cultures and answered across culture. And, and they, they're answered if they're not done explicitly, implicitly, at least. And so how can we get explicit about it, I think is the question I'd ask. Yeah, no, that's great. Um, so I'm seeing another question in the chat. We've got about 15 minutes left, so we're going to try to address all the all the wonderful questions that have come in. Could someone talk about how to best enroll the press and media in reporting on protest and getting journalists to report accurately about the goals of the protest? Somebody want to take that? I mean, the quick answer is to do their work for them. Yes. Right? Write your press releases, put out the Twitter, do the whole thing. And a lot of times, particularly in the U.S., where there's such an a, a, such a low number of people actually engaged in professional media reporting these days, they will use your stuff. Yep. Agreed. Yvonne, Carlos, Jake, any other suggestions? Anything that moves beyond protest. You know, yes. uh, you know, protest is kind of an important but very shallow form of uh, of citizen engagement. You know, and like we move from protest to non-cooperation, from non-cooperation to like building parallel institutions. You know, like first protest is like, oh, you want to, you need to hear what we have to say. The non-cooperation is like, we don't want to work with you. We're like, enough is enough. And then parallel institution is, we don't need you actually. We'll do it on our own. So like. You know that is that is where you know uh, you know it, it's kind of difficult for for journalists to spot that uh, you know when like some very powerful parallel institutions when they're built by the civil society they see that but most often they don't and they need help in like finding that out. 
Yeah, I'm thinking about like all the mutual support networks, all of the, you know, kind of mini solidarity funds to support people who go on strikes and things like that, all important and often off the radar screen. Jake, I think I see you wanting to. Uh, no, I agree with everything. And the one thing I would add is just bringing the relational element in. Yeah. I've, I've learned that that is really cool. Like journalists, if there is a journalist, is a person who's trying to deal with things and how do we, yeah, invite the relationship and create opportunities. like create opportunities for them to see something that that is worth writing about i think that's what Nadine was getting at but not forgetting these are not like objects they're people and how do we actually treat them as people which can mean a lot of different things i'm thinking now i forget that just in terms of resources so we're since we're sending a uh, sharing a ton in the chat um recall for me the the video that was done on how to engage the the media um uh, josh yeager and others had done a whole series of like short videos on how to effectively engage the mainstream media, mainly as part of nonviolent action. So if one of my colleagues knows what I'm talking about and is able to find the chat, that would be great, great as well. Um, there was a like a Kenya specific question. And to summarize, um, the person was asking how to get um, resources to African countries, not just that are experiencing violent conflict, but that are experiencing backsliding democracies. And I would link that as well to, you know, Jake, your provocation about the US, how do you engage in collective bargaining with funders, I think is how you put it, to be able to support kind of long-term training and capacity building. So did anyone wanna address um, that question? Nadine, um, I I was well I'm I'm sort of musing about a few things about um, it's it's a process I think of helping I, I mean it, I think this is difficult right how because also for my perspective I'm really in in and, and there was a lot of chatter in the chat about the spectrum or the continuum from uh, nonviolent action or people power action to peace building, and where we see that there's a lot of a lot more investment going into the peace building end of things because it's a safer investment generally, um, easier for 501c3s and c4s uh, to put money into them, and then uh, the same thing probably with conflict situations. Um, uh, it's much more obvious for groups, much more, uh, you know, there's a shiny object and people go towards it or a crisis moment and people go towards that where, um, I, I mean, I mean, this is like being in the United States where some of us really think that we're on the verge of a, of a potential civil war descending into violent conflict as well. And there's not as much investment in addressing that as one would expect in that moment because it's, uh, not being covered in the media to such an extent, or it's not as easy to figure out what to do in that instance. Um, so, uh, I mean, research that shows which, and I rely a lot on research and groups that are knowing specific situations to identify what the threats are and then try to leverage that with funders. Could help the same way you might point out to the media what's happening, you have to point out to funders what's happening. The same way you might build personal relationships with media in your town where you're doing work, you're going to build personal relationships with funders or have trusted people um, advise them to give support in certain ways. Um, and, you know, and, and in particular, like I take it one more step where there are a lot of groups who, for example, in the United States, there are more groups promoting dialogue than there are groups promoting preparation to do any kind of actual disruptive activity if we need to to let's say reclaim an election uh, or ballot boxes on a very basic level. And so there's always there, there's always that tension there. And so I don't I don't have a good answer. Um, I have a lot of thoughts about it and I'm sure other my other panelists probably have more to say. Others, Yvonne, did you want to say something? That's a tough one. Yeah, let's let's try let let have Carlos or Jake <laughs> chip in. <laughs> no, but that's already good stuff. But I think you know, and there probably undoubtedly are some funders on this call. So I think just the provocation of how to think about you know um, 
Jake, you said democracy fund or just something that really is intentionally uh, supportive of long-term training, coaching, mentoring, I think is really important with the argument that it builds organization, it builds culture, it builds everything you need uh, kind of for successful movement. So that's, um, I've definitely been hearing you all say that. Um, there was one, I think, uh, that I saw in the chat. It was about, um, uh, seems to me what's missing in the U.S. democracy scene is any kind of visible, replicable local activity that people can do. Um, did anyone want to address that? I thought that was a very good point. It linked to the one about media coverage yeah. as well. Uh, Yvonne. Actually, yeah, actually, I, I was I was looking at that one when, when you asked me the, 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 the question about funders. So I was like, you know, caught off guard, yeah. but because I was preparing for... for for that one, I find that actually a really good question, and I'll tell you a, like a little, uh, a little uh, anecdote. Uh, and one of the participants in the uh, on this call was there with me. We did we did the workshop in uh, Tanzania some years ago, and like we we met some people who were uh, running a campaign on freedom of expression because they were protecting like the freedom of expression. And when they would go uh, to like ordinary citizens and talk about like, yeah, we need to kind of save or protect freedom of expression. The, the majority answer was like freedom of speech, freedom of expression, that's a rich man's problem. And the thing was like, who is buying newspapers? Who is reading the news? Those who are affluent, you know, like poor people don't have time for that. And the big effort that they had to take was to actually bring the freedom of expression down to the level of everyday life. And like, what does it mean? Like, what is freedom of expression on a day-to-day -day basis? Like, how do we know what, what are they doing to us? And like, how are they misusing funds? How are they, you know, like uh, benefiting themselves and all that stuff? So. So I think democracy, similarly to that, is not just something that we're talking on, on the high levels of like a Madisonian democracy and like, you know, the, the, the three branches of power and checks and balances. No, no, we need to kind of see how that practice is related to everyday lives of people and the things that they're struggling with, you know. And this, this is, I think, the work of movements and the work of organizers. And this is kind of to go back to that, you know, concepts, values, and skills. Like, what is the concept of democracy where we can read books? What is the value of democracy? Is that, why were we going to fight to preserve it? But also, what is the democratic skill that we need to practice in every day? Like, how do we talk with our own neighbors? How do we, uh, you know, bring issues to the, to the forefront? How do we debate? How do we discuss? And how do we find consensus? So like all these levels need to kind of actually create a, a democratic spirit uh, amongst the people where they are. Yeah. Can I add to that? Yeah, please. Yeah, I really resonate with it. There's, uh, it's making me think of something we talked a lot about, which is uh, the three faces of power, Stephen Luke's, this mm -hmm. idea of the, on the ground, the, the direct manifestation of power, someone getting arrested or not getting arrested. And there's the second face of who's making the laws that that is the rule or not and then there's the third face of what do people even consider possible like well why would we even think about that and so often we go to the third face and i think what yvonne is pointing to is the importance of going to the first the, ex the direct experience and having an experience of shift there but then the challenge is how to link it i think to the second and third face and similarly like the local i think michael had been written about a local level I mean, I think the right has done a lot more work on the local level. I mean, it's always easy to say the right's doing all this great stuff and us not, but it does seem to be the case that there's been a lot more intentional local advocacy work where it's happening at the state and local level and that's adding up. And whereas I think there's been a lot of focus and a lot of organizations are reflecting on this. We did a bunch of work with the Sunrise Movement. It's an amazing work, um, but reflecting on the focus on the federal level, it, it, there's limits to that. I mean, Carlos, you're mentioning it, right? You go to ask for something. It's like, well, do we have the power or not? And the, the challenge of how do you link local, state, and national in, in strategy, but also organization. I mean, that used to be, I think, a lot of the federated structures that existed. Unions still have that structure to some extent. That was my experience. 
you had the shop floor, there'd be a, a unit in the shop floor in a hospital, right? There'd be a unit, then there'd be the whole hospital, and then there'd be all the hospitals. You know, how do you address the thing that's happening in this unit, but how do you link it to what's happening in the whole hospital and all the hospitals so that the power is built on those three levels? And I think, yeah, there's often a, a missing of that direct unit because we're like, well, the big thing is the thing. Well, it's all of the things are the thing, I, I think. Yeah. I mean, and incidentally, we've been thinking a lot about what a federated structure, kind of a united front would would look like in this current context, given all the authoritarian threats that we're facing. And I think there was a really important point in the chat that this is not just a free and fair election things. There are attacks on freedom of assembly, freedom of speech. There are books that are being banned. There are violent attacks on, you know, ordinary people, people, election observers, the like. So it's a whole gamut. So we need to think about author authoritarianism kind of as a system that manifests in different ways locally. So being able to spot it and articulate it and explain it, I think is really important as part of this organizing work as well. So the great thing is that we got through all the questions or at least all those that I saw in the chat. I wanted to offer though, all of our panelists were magnificent and wonderful um, in sharing their wisdom and experiences with all of us to give them 45 seconds each to maybe articulate where you would want this conversation to go next. So if you had a dream, because at Horizons, we're committed to wanting to support these types of conversations and convenings, like where would you want this to go next? So maybe uh, do we want to go in the order? Uh, Yvonne, uh, Nadine, Jake, Carlos. And you have to end by 3.30 promptly. Okay. I want this to go next in the following direction. We need need to talk more about the crisis of dictatorship that is happening around the world. And it's not visible, but it's going to happen. And it's going to happen very soon and things are going to unravel and we need to be ready for it. And uh, and I think that the authoritarians have, uh, how should I say, tried all their tricks and there are not many tricks left. And uh, I think it's uh, showtime soon. And uh, yeah, we need to talk about that. Excellent. Thank you, Ivan. Uh, Nadine. Uh, a second that and um, being not afraid to call fascist fascist if we need to so we know uh, who we are working with. And I think the other thing is to is to continue this talk. So we we said, I said already, we're really good at starting things. We don't always follow through in the middle section. And then we write some high level stuff. No, let's actually follow through and let's help people understand the difference between a structure and a hierarchy, between anarchy and a lack of any kind of structure, between and actually develop a, a respect and a proper effective use of some kind of network or coordinating structure, which we haven't had for, you know, progressive movements since, you know, the 80s with the Pledge of Resistance, or maybe you could say the direct action network in the early 2000s, but 9-11 really dealt a blow. And let's prepare people, as Yvonne said, for taking real risk and putting in place what we can to support people and build community for the real risks that are going to be needed in person, not online, to actually protect our ability to work together for a better future. Awesome, Jake. Yeah, I just uh, sign on to what Nadine was saying. I think um, how do we coordinate and support the mutual work going on? I think Carlos was speaking to it earlier as well. Like there's all this rich, rich work and how does it, yeah, how does it speak to each other and support one another and not be as well scattered? Excellent. Well, I think Horizons can commit to at least supporting the compilation of resources and trainings and the like, building on all the amazing work that you all and others in the chat are part of. So we will definitely work on that. Carlos, take us home. This is about dignity. And I think that's how we can organize because I would love to talk to people about that because I think what we're missing is the values. And I think that's why we can mobilize people at all levels. Oh, hi, babe. And yeah, that's it. Thank you all. Oh, that's wonderful. So we have children coming into the picture as well, which is a beautiful thing. So um, I just wanted to thank um, our wonderful panelists for uh, sharing just such great insights, wisdom with us all today. Thank all of you for joining us uh, from whichever part of the world you're calling in from. We really look forward to continuing this conversation. We've all been taking meticulous notes on how we could take it in different directions. And I think we've heard some really great suggestions for how to do that. So thank you. Um, um, to everyone, thank you to our panelists, and I hope everyone has a great uh, rest of their day or evening. Bye-bye.